In this episode of The Education of a Value Investor, my co-host Georgina Godwin will interview Jahangir Apu. Jahangir is a former cardiothoracic surgeon, otherwise known as a heart surgeon, from Calgary, Alberta, in the province of Alberta in Canada. Although he was born in India and grew up in places like Dubai and Iran, I met Jahangir when I hosted a Jeffersonian meal in Toronto. There was a room of about 14 of us uh, that included Neil Pasricha, amongst other people, and we had a wonderful conversation. It was a great way to meet Jahangir. I'm actually blown away because Jahangir, in addition to being an extraordinarily accomplished heart surgeon, has all the makings of an extraordinary entrepreneur, and I think that we've caught him at the beginning of uh, an exciting and interesting career in the business of medicine. I think that what really makes Jangir stand out for me is that of all the guests that I've had in Jeffersonian Meals, Jangir is the only one who's gone and actually hosted one himself, inspired by a Jeffersonian meal that he attended with me to host, I think, a series of Jeffersonian Meals. And uh, he talks about that uh, to Georgina, which is a fun part of the interview for me. In any case, I hope you enjoy meeting Jahangir. Jahangir, how wonderful to meet you. And as Guy's alluded to, you're at the intersection of, of venture capital, medicine and impact financing. But what I really want to know is how it all began. Now, you're Canadian, you grew up in Calgary. Did you always want to be a scientist or a doctor? I didn't actually grow up in Calgary. In some ways, I still think I'm growing up. I've uh, been in Calgary for over 15 years, which is the longest time I've spent in one city in my life. I actually grew up all over. I was born in India. I lived in Iran. I lived in Dubai. I lived in Japan. Spent some time in England. Went to high school in the States and then studied in Montreal, up in northern Alberta, and uh, spent a year in the UK at the Royal Brompton Hospital in Chelsea and another year at New Penn in Philadelphia before settling here. I didn't quite grow up in Canada. I arrived in Canada when I was 18. How do you, um, I, how do you identify though? Where's home for you? Yeah, home is Canada now. It's actually interesting because like I moved around so much every few years. There's lots of benefits of doing that and seeing different cultures and being adapting and being part of different societies. On the other hand, I think that was, you know, one thing that was tough is always like not belonging to a certain place. I left India when I was five, so I have roots there. I've been back often, but I'm not, I didn't really grow up there. I didn't go to school there as such. So I'm kind of now happy to be in Canada and settled and have a place that's home. So where did the love of medicine come from? Yeah, it's, uh, I find that's interesting because I have a 16 year old daughter and a lot of people you know, at this stage, at a young stage of thinking about what they want to do. And it's so hard to kind of envision where you're going to end up, what you're going to do. And there's multiple points that lead you in different directions. So I, for one, had zero interest in medicine growing up as a kid. I was interested in science and I couldn't even stand the sight of blood on TV or watch a movie that had any blood or gore. And then one day I was in university, I came home and told my parents I was going to apply to med school and they just laughed at me. So it was like a totally out of the blue thing. And the reason it happened is I started studying sort of more of the hard science and sort of chemistry. And then I switched to biochemistry and I took a course in genetics and then another course around genetic and inherited diseases. And I really liked the specific aspect of cancer therapy that I thought was going to cure cancer. And that was the only reason I went to med school was because I was interested in this technology called reverse mRNA, which was supposed to be the cure for cancer. So that was the only thing I wanted to do in med school. And uh, so I went in for that reason. But you ended and up I, being a heart surgeon. Yeah. So then I did my first uh, rotation in oncology and hematology. I felt like personally, like internalized every symptom of somebody having chemotherapy. I felt tired. I felt fatigued, nauseated, and I just sort of, I did not enjoy the rotation at all, but I still I enjoyed multiple things in medicine. And then uh, I was excited about internal medicine. I was excited about surgery. I had no interest in heart surgery, but I took a rotation in that because of 
other reasons, I thought it'd be good practice and I'd get to learn more of my cardiology skills. And there's more room to operate when you're in a, a student and you're in heart surgery. When you do other types of surgeries, you're in a small little hole and the student doesn't get to do anything. So heart surgery is kind of nice for a student because there's like lots of space. And the chest is wide open and the legs open. So you get to practice your suturing. So I thought it'd be kind of boring, but good practice. And I did a rotation in that, really enjoyed it. And then I had a kind of unusual experience when I was on holiday. And then I just decided to follow that. What was the unusual experience? So uh, my brother and I were visiting India as tourists. And we were in Delhi and we went to see the Taj Mahal. And not far from the Taj is something called the Baby Taj. And in this country where there's just a billion people and just madness everywhere, there's like nobody at this really beautiful monument, except for a couple that turned out to be the dean of my medical school from McGill in Montreal. So this is the only people there. And I knew this person. So we had like a brief conversation, which was quite superficial, actually. It was the usual thing that happens when a doctor talks to a student is like, what are you interested in? What are you going to do? What's the next step? And I was like, well, I like general surgery. I like internal medicine. I like all these things. And I just finished this elective in cardiac surgery and I really enjoyed it. And uh, he told me, uh, well, you know, once you've seen the light, don't turn your back on it. And I got on a plane the next day. We were taking off. I was just looking out the window and then I decided that's what I was going to do. And so you did and have become... I did, yeah, because like there was like I had multiple choices. I just had this great rotation, but I've been having all these great experiences. And at some point one had to choose. And he said, well, son, you know, he was kind of a little bit elderly and stoic. And uh, once you've seen the light, don't turn your back on it. So I decided to follow that path. Yeah. But you did eventually turn your back on it after practicing for, for a long time. Yeah, so cardiac surgery is uh, extremely rewarding and technically fascinating and room for innovation and do do neat things and cardiac surgery is interesting to me because it allows you to interact with all of humanity it affects all different aspects of society and so i think that's the neat thing about medicine is that in a lot of other jobs one siloed into a particular type of group of people that you interact with and yet there's these billions of people on planet Earth that we have to interact with all the time, or at least cohabit with. And so cardiac surgery allowed for a deep interaction, not superficial, but because of the topic and the nature that we're talking about, people were willing to be very open. So I was able to speak to all types of members of society. We had a lot of success in terms of academic accomplishments as well in heart surgery. I had some issues with my neck where after a few years of battling, I was just physically not able to continue operating. At that point, it became a question of what do I do next? If I'm not going to operate, I spent all these years practicing that art. And I felt that if I was to do something different, which I looked at, is like, would I still have impact? Like I've always been interested in impact and moving the needle. So when I couldn't operate, I started looking at different things to do. Just before we go on to your, your career change or your, or your slight pivot, I just wonder about the healthcare systems in the different places, because, of course, you were studying and teaching medicine in Canada, in the UK and in the USA. And I wonder if you saw a marked difference there and also perhaps who has the better healthcare system? So in terms of the last question, the better healthcare system, it all depends on who's measuring it? Is it better for the individual or is it better for the population? In my experience, the US has great healthcare, probably some of the best in the world, but they also have, unfortunately, healthcare that's not very good. So when you average out, you know, a student who's getting 100 with a student who's getting a 30, the overall average isn't that great. So on a population basis, the US spends a ton on healthcare and their population outcomes aren't great. But as a particular individual, one could potentially have access to awesome therapy. The other thing is this concept of universal healthcare is now in today's lexicon across the world, it's almost part of human rights and like the fresh air, clean water, healthcare. And that's not integrated in US society. So that's a huge hurdle that it 
the U.S. as a first world nation needs to overcome at some point. And then Canada and, and the U.K. have somewhat similar types of systems. The U.K. has a both a public and a private healthcare system. And in Canada, theoretically, by law, there's no private healthcare system. So that's kind of like a distinction. At the same time, each individual practitioner in Canada bills the government for each procedure. So like the government's like a credit card. Each time you see a patient, you do a procedure, you bill the government. Whereas the NHS, you're more of a salaried employee. I right. think there's pros and cons to both systems. It's not ideal. Neither are ideal. And there's probably room for improvement on both sides. At the end of the day, healthcare is super expensive as a society. So it's a question of how do you balance optimal outcomes for society with leaving enough money to pay for roads and schools and police departments and other things, because healthcare costs can always go up. Yeah. We should just point out how incredibly accomplished you were in this field before you left it. Two fellowships, the first in advanced cardiovascular surgery at the Royal Brompton Hospital Imperial College here in London, the second at the thoracic aortic surgery, endovascular aortic surgery and heart failure surgery team from the University of Pennsylvania. You've been a clinical associate professor of cardiac surgery at the University of Calgary. You also helped establish the Artificial Heart Programme and you performed Southern Alberta's first artificial heart device implant. So, I mean, this is all huge accomplishments, including founding and directing until 2019 the Calgary Thoracic aortic program. And of course, that has an enormous international reputation. So leaving all of that must have been really quite a wrench, wasn't it? I think anytime you get sort of like, I think maybe it goes back to like, you know, your question, like, how did you get involved in medicine and like, not anticipating what's next, connecting the dots, you can do that, looking back, but going forward, it's impossible, right? So at that time, you're kind of flooded with the mind's just buzzing in terms of where you go, what you do. And uh, for me, it's just a question of being methodical, one thing at a time, and just working really hard, chiseling away at trying to figure out where one wants to land at. In some ways, like in today's world, so many of us are fortunate that we have so many opportunities. There's different things we can do. Historically, people were siloed into things and uh, didn't have that opportunity. So the ability to democratize knowledge today, the ability to interact easily. It's a really powerful stage where we have so much access to knowledge. We can learn anything we want at any time. And so if there is a volition to be a continuous learner throughout life, you have so many opportunities open to you. And yeah, for sure, because I think, you know, we all had plans as to how things are going to roll out and what happens I've found is that when you have some success, it actually opens up more opportunities and more interesting opportunities, more exciting things to do. And then you have plans to build that and then doing that will allow you to get to another level. So all these things are already, you can see where things are going and then you get uh, you know, put out in left field and you just have to re reassess. So to use the parlance of the day, tell me about your pivot. <laughs> yeah, so what I'm doing right now is I've always been interested in healthcare and I've always enjoyed healthcare. And for me, it was about if I'm not going to operate, how am I going to have an ongoing impact in healthcare? And uh, one of the things as physicians is that most of our work is on a one-on-one -on -one basis. There's a finite number of people in a particular day that you can impact and it's not necessarily scalable. So what I've ended up is at this intersection of venture capital, balancing with that, with my previous experience in value investing and uh, technology, healthcare and impact and sort of colliding completely different worlds. So historically technology and healthcare have been very sort of separate, mostly because of a couple of things. Well, healthcare is, you know, if there's anything goes wrong in healthcare, it's, it's drastic. And secondly, healthcare has just been slow to adopt technology and specifically digital technology. There's a real opportunity in that right now because we do everything else in our lives digitally. You and I are talking digitally right now. We do our finance, our entertainment, communication, everything is digital. Why do we not have healthcare on our phones? Why are we not interacting digitally with healthcare? 
But the great thing is that from a healthcare point of view, it's like, you don't have to figure everything out. It's already been done. Like all this technology has been built. We just need to adapt it to make impact. And the second thing is with some of the digital technology in healthcare, a lot of it is bells and whistles. It's nice to have information. It sounds cool, looks good, but it doesn't truly impact the way you treat a patient, their mortality rate, their readmission rate, the complication rate. So what we're interested in is where can we apply digital technology that's gonna make an impact in medicine and help scale that. Let's talk specifically about a couple of things that you're involved with. So you talk about this organization that you're involved in, which is the aim is to be part of the evolution of how AI is used for medical diagnosis, for therapeutics and for infrastructure. Tell us about that first. Yeah, so AIoT Health is a uh, venture capital fund that I run, and I'm interested in the application of machine learning in healthcare to make a true impact. And so when we look at machine learning, to me, this is a revolutionary technology that reminds me of when I started university, there was this thing called www. And nobody could accurately predict how we're going to be using that 30 years from then. There are lots of theories and things. So with machine learning, I think it's the same thing. There's a lot of potential applications, but how do we actually use it in a meaningful way? And for me, I want to focus on my experience at the front lines of healthcare to figure out how to use machine learning in a meaningful way in healthcare. And that's a journey that to me has impact because that book hasn't been written yet, right? It's going to be written. I think we want to help shape that path. I don't think it's any one person, but by working with multiple companies in the space, we end up learning more and more and have developed domain expertise. And as we do that, we can help shape the path of how it's done. And the idea for us is we're working with really bright people from all over the place who've got cool applications. And as we work with them, we learn more. As we learn more, we apply it to the other companies that we work with and the next company we see. And five, 10 years down the road, if there's a company in London or in Hong Kong or in Zurich that's doing something really interesting in machine learning and healthcare, they might reach out to us because we've worked with 30 companies in this space and understand the crevices, understand the applications, understand how it can change outcomes. It's an exciting space to be because it's evolving and it's a place that can have, make a big change in the way medicine is practiced. So medicine is kind of neat because it's both a science and an art. And uh, as clinicians, I think we pride ourselves on both aspects. But when we dive deep on it, a lot of what we call the art of medicine is only because we don't understand the science and the data yet. And so what happens is when medicine is an art, it's not scalable and, and reproducible to the same effect for a whole population. And sometimes you're making wrong calls because it's an art. I could just get this gut feeling. So at the end of the day, you don't want clinicians to be making decisions based on gut feelings because sometimes they might work out well properly, but then other times they don't work out well. And that's not a great reproducible thing for a healthcare organization. So machine learning has the ability to give us information that we just don't know yet in healthcare. There's certain things we monitor and outcomes that we predict, but it's still fairly rudimentary. That balance of art and science is going to shift more towards science with the application of machine learning. So you're also then involved in Creative Destruction Lab, and, and that's, that's a non-profit organization, but it's very much bound up with this work, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So Creative Destruction Lab is an interesting partnership between scientists coming out of universities, business schools, venture capital, and entrepreneurs with the goal of building big businesses. The idea of taking a project from the lab and building it into a business and into a big business. And the whole space of innovation and venture capital is gaining a lot of interest because that's where it seems like a lot of the bright people are. That's where true value is being created. That's where, you know, huge ideas are coming out of. So with the Creative Destruction Lab, we work and mentor companies to help scale them. I wonder how 
predisposed people are to want to invest in that area at the moment. I mean, I suppose that that this pandemic must have made an enormous difference when you look, for instance, at the huge rise in, in the value of, of companies like BioNTech. The pandemic's had uh, an impact in a few different ways. So it, one is healthcare is on everyone's mind now. People see the impact of healthcare. The second thing the pandemic has done is it's brought on digital technology into healthcare because we've had to do virtual care. If you and I could have an appointment this way rather than in person, there could be multiple benefits for the patient and family. And that was never really, although it was possible, it was never done before, but now it's been accepted. And because it's accepted, the next step is how do we do a physical exam now? Right. So you and I can talk, we can have a conversation, we can figure out what's going on, but how do we do an exam? So there's this whole field of remote patient monitoring. So there's certain devices that you could have that would be wirelessly transmitting data so that when patients having interaction with the physician, they, they actually have data that may be even more sensitive than their usual physical exam. So I think that whole space has opened up and government systems have introduced reimbursement codes for these type of visits and for this type of patient monitoring, all because of the pandemic. Tobias Lutke from Shopify said this a little while ago, was that what COVID has done is brought 2030 a decade early for some industries that already had a little bit of momentum. So for certain things in healthcare and investing in digital technology in healthcare and the applications of rethinking how healthcare works, COVID has actually accelerated that process. Mm -hmm. And I suppose made healthcare companies just so much more valuable and, and so much more desirable as investments. I mean, particularly when you look at Canada, so for or Calgary to be specific, Calgary without oil must surely be a, a big yeah. worry coming at people there. For sure. So people are looking to reinvent and uh, to diversify and be in different spaces. And there's two ways of looking at healthcare. You can look at healthcare as a political drain on capital and expenses, or you can actually look at it as something that contributes to the economy. You think of the percentage of the people that actually work in healthcare, all the different uh, accessories that come around having healthcare institutions. So it can actually contribute to the economy. So what we're seeing is healthcare as a space is expanding and also expanding because more and more today, I don't know, get your take on this, but we find that like young people are interested in having a career and having a job, making money, but people are actually interested in impact today. People want to make a difference. And I feel that that's more so today than maybe decades ago and maybe centuries ago, where people were just trying to focus on surviving. I think we've got to a stage where people are interested in doing good and doing good is just good business. Yeah. Guy tells me that you are one of the most entrepreneurial minded doctors that he's ever met. And now that that is in fact what you do, you're on a much more entrepreneurial track. I wonder how you kept that bottled in all those years as a doctor. Were you longing to kind of start new things? I don't know if I ever recognized it or thought about it that way, Georgina. I think I was pretty satisfied with what I was doing. What I was always longing for was to solve problems. So there's a few things you can do in medicine. It took me a while to realize both are okay. So there's a huge amount of to learn and to apply safely in medicine. And doing that, I think, is a task by itself. But then even amongst all that learning, there's still problems in there. Like, you know, so if you do this operation and 5% of people or 10% of people have a stroke. Well, that's understood. But, you know, for me, it was always like the why behind it and trying to solve that. So yeah. that's what kind of interested me. It was one thing is to apply it safely, but it, the next thing was to question it and try to figure out how to improve it. So I think that's what kind of kept me interested and actually keeps a lot of doctors interested in what they do is trying to improve that process. Now, I know that you were an investor in Guy's Fund, and you also came together over Jeffersonian Meals. Can you explain what that is? I'd never heard of that till Guy introduced me to it. Uh, so he hosted this dinner in Toronto that he invited me to, and I flew down from Calgary for it. 
And the idea behind Jeffersonian meal is around connection. It's a fairly simple concept, which is you have 10 or 12 people sitting around a dinner table, having a good meal and wine. And really the only rule of the dinner is that there can be only one conversation at a time. So no sidebar conversations. Hi, Georgina, nice to meet you. Where are you from? What's happening? This, that, the other. Whatever the conversation is, it's a table-wide conversation. And it's about connecting with people and it could be focused on particular topics. So let's talk about healthcare, right? Or let's talk about politics or philanthropy or anything. Or it could just be about general topics and just see where the conversation goes and learn about each other. And I think at the end of the day, what Guy was doing was about connecting people and getting people to share thoughts and ideas. And I was really impressed with it. So I started hosting a couple of them over here in Calgary. And it's always, you know, you talk about being entrepreneurial. Like anytime you do something different, it kind of puts you out there as taking some risks, right? Like people might think you're crazy. You, know, you set up this event, nobody shows up, nobody's interested, two people show up, right? But they were both big successes and they were with some people that I knew and I learned new things about them. And then there were some people I didn't know that we got to connect with. And so that was a great way to increase your network and to have meaningful conversations. I'm not great on superficial stuff like the weather and, you know, how are things just a general type of sometimes cocktail party type of stuff. So it's a little bit more meaningful. There's one conversation at a time, everybody gets a chance to contribute. And, you know, the thing that really stood out about Guy is that when I reached out to him saying, I had a great time at your dinner and I'd like to host this and I'd like to have some tips about how to do it properly. Well, he took the time, an hour on the phone, he called me from Zurich. It's really important to identify who's wilting, how to get the group together, told me all these tips and tricks as to how to host this in a meaningful way. I thought that was really kind of him. Do you think it's possible to host a Jeffersonian dinner over Zoom? It was one of my first thoughts that crossed my mind when this COVID thing happened is like, what do we, you know, should we do this over Zoom? I haven't done it. I think there's just a lot of Zoom fatigue for a lot of that stuff. I think Zoom has been awesome in terms of connecting people overall. So I haven't done the Jeffersonian. What I did do recently <laughs> is that in that same spirit is that I realized that I'm actually an introvert and I'm okay being cocooned in my place and uh, during COVID, but that's not necessarily a positive and it is important to meet people and connect with people. So I set up sort of what I would consider like a ambulatory Jeffersonian. So I set up a walk every Sunday afternoon and invited a whole bunch of people to join me, just a one-on-one. -on -one. It's a simple link and people just sign up and we go for a walk and have a conversation about something for two hours. And in this way, I'm connecting with people that I haven't seen in the last six, eight months, but I would see before. I don't need to necessarily see them, but they're interesting people and also very diverse people. So I think maybe the idea of being connected is important and being connected in a meaningful way. What are you most excited about? I mean, what do you think the most exciting development in healthcare is going to be? Overall, healthcare has had actually amazing improvements over the last century. Just to think about it, like 120 years ago, we could not treat something as simple as appendicitis. People just died in their 20s, in their teenagers, 30s from appendicitis, so something that's so treatable today. I'm actually really impressed by how far we've come. And so the next stage, I think, in healthcare is this concept of what's called personalized healthcare. So given all that we've learned, like a lot of what we've learned today has been from this concept that we call a randomized controlled trial. So it's very robust, scientific, difficult to do, expensive, but it's given us great data. And what a randomized controlled trial does is we'll take 10,000 patients and give them treatment A, and then take another 10,000 patients, give them treatment B. And the patients don't know what was in that pill right? They don't know if what they got or they got a placebo. And at the end of the day, we'll analyze the results. And so maybe three years later, we see that patients in treatment A had a 70% survival rate and patients in treatment B had a 55% survival rate. So as physicians, clinicians, we say in the future, we give everybody treatment A 
But the next stage in healthcare is understanding which groups, which people in treatment A would actually have done better with treatment B and vice versa. And so it's about individualizing healthcare. So far, everything in healthcare is about population outcomes. When we do this strategy for this disease, this generally works well. But now that we've got this huge amount of knowledge and data, we can now take it down to the individual level. And I think that's where some of these digital technologies and machine learnings will play you know, a huge part in delivering that personalized healthcare. Like maybe what's right for you is not optimal for me and vice versa. Right now, we don't know that. We just know that if you have a heart attack, these are the standard treatments, right? If you have cancer, if you have dementia, et cetera, this is the way it's treated. But now we're at this era of knowledge and nuance where we can actually figure out for the individual. The three kind of super exciting areas in healthcare to me are number one is the brain. Because until now, we've had very rudimentary skills to understand the brain and how the brain works and how to change diseases of the brain. So I think the whole neuroscience space is exploding because of the advent of accessibility to technologies that can help understand the brain. So that would be an exciting part to go into if somebody was interested in going to med school today. Second aspect that I think is super interesting is cancer because the biology is interesting and the therapies are exciting. But there's a huge amount of infrastructure in the cure to cancer and to stop cancer. So that's a great space to get into. And the third space that I think is super exciting is this longevity space. I've always been interested in this since I got into med school is like, why do we age? What is it biochemically about us that makes us grow old? And we're starting to learn some of those things. So once we start to learn some of those things, we might be able to modify them. So this idea of lifespan and health span, I think is super exciting. Do you think it'll be too late for you and me to hang out? No, 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 no. We're right. It's perfect time. Perfect time. It's, it's great. Yeah. There's things that you can do out there already and there's amazing stuff happening. So yeah, we're still like, that's the other thing is that if you think about that, we have to stay engaged. This idea of retiring at 65, we might have another good 40, 50 years after that. So what are you going to do with your life and how are you going to have impact and how are you going to enjoy it? And the other thing is as things change so fast, like how does one stay relevant? Like if one is not engaged in some sort of meaningful connection occupation, it's really challenging to stay relevant doing your hobbies. Uh, kind of giving you long-winded answers here, Georgina, sorry. It's really <laughs> fabulous. Is there anything else you'd like to say? What have we talked about? We talked about like an optimistic view of the future of healthcare. We've talked about uh, cool aspects in technology and how we're going to apply that. And I think, I guess my view is tainted with uh, optimism. <laughs>